I call your attention this evening to the epistle to the Ephesians in the second chapter, and I want to read to you the first ten verses. The first ten verses in the second chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace he are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us, through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now I want in particular tonight to call your attention to the first two words in the fourth verse. And the two words are, but God. Now those of you who are familiar with the writings of this great and mighty apostle will have noticed often that these two words, but God, are the words with which this man almost invariably introduces the gospel. He does so here in a very typical manner. In the first three verses of this chapter, he has been reminding these Ephesian Christians of what they were like before they became Christian. He gives this terrifying description of their state and condition. Then suddenly, but God. And then he reminds them of what God did to them, how the gospel came to them, and the effects and the results of the coming of the gospel. That, that's his method. He uses these two words, but God, as a kind of conjunction, a point of transition from sin to salvation, from man in his utter hopelessness to God in his almighty power. They are undoubtedly his favorite words. So watch him always as you read him. Watch for this little word, but and especially when it's followed by God, for he's about to introduce to you and hold before your wondering and admiring gaze something of the glory and the excellences of the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Well, now here I say he does it in a very typical and characteristic manner. But I want to try to show you tonight that these two words not only come like this as a kind of introduction to the gospel, I want to try to show you that in and of themselves they are a kind of epitome, a kind of summary of the content of the gospel. I want to try to show you that in these words the apostle immediately is suggesting to us the basic fundamental themes and tenets of our Christian faith. Now, I want to do that in this particular form and manner. I want to suggest to you this evening that these are the two words that should be found most frequently, indeed constantly, on the lips of Christian people at a time such as this. Let me put it like this. Here we are, Christian people. Though we are Christian, we are still living in the same world as everybody else. We are subject to the same slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, to the same vicissitudes, 
to the same stresses and strains as everybody else, same as our neighbors, same as our colleagues, same as all our acquaintances. And as we mix with them, travel with them in trains, meet them uh, for lunch somewhere or have ordinary conversation in a social sense, they talk about life, they talk about the world, they talk about what's happening. Have you heard the news, they say? Have you read the paper? And they hold before us the whole world situation and the teeming problems that are afflicting mankind at this present hour. And then they begin to express their opinions. They express and indulge in their forebodings. Isn't it terrible? They say, what's going to happen? And so they speak and give their opinions and impressions and indulge in their prognostications. And then they finish. And then, when they finish, you and I begin. And what is it we have to say to them? Well, I want to put it to you tonight that what we have to say to them is something like this. Yes, we say, everything you've been saying is very right and it's perfectly true. The times are evil, the times are out of joint. The outlook is indeed black, as you say, but God. And then we begin to tell them what the gospel has got to say about it all. Now, that's it. You see, the gospel begins always where man ends. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. That's precisely how the gospel invariably comes into the situation. And that is how it comes into the situation here. Well, now then. Let's look at these two words that we're always to be using. This is the Christian position. We make this protest. We have always this but. When men has finished, when the statesmen have finished, when the philosophers have finished and have come to naught, we begin. And we begin with this mighty word, but God. Why do we do that? What is the content of what we have to say? Well, let's look at the words. What does this little word but suggest to us? I suggest to you that in the first place, it invariably suggests hope. It is the but of hope. Look at it in its setting here. Here are these first three verses in which the apostle gives this terrifying analysis of the state and the condition of these Ephesians before they became Christians, and it's absolutely and completely hopeless. Nothing could be more hopeless as I'm going to show you. Then suddenly he says, but... And the moment he says so, you feel there's a protest. It isn't the end. There is still something possible. The butt of hope. So I want to lay it down as my first principle this evening. That the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is literally the only hope in this world this evening. It is the only message that holds out any hope for the individual. It is the only message that holds out any hope for the world at large. The only hope. And when I say that, I'm not indulging in what some people tend to call pulpit exaggeration. I propose to demonstrate to you that what I'm saying is nothing but the simple and the literal truth. And when I say that the gospel is literally the only hope in the world tonight, I am indeed thinking of the greatest statesmen and all your philosophers and all your educationalists and all the people who are trying to improve the lot of men and who are trying to improve the whole case of the entire world. I say that looking at them all, that I assert here on behalf of this gospel that this is the only hope in the world tonight. But can you prove that, says someone? Well, I think I can. And I think I can do so very simply. I do so like this. I say that the gospel is the only hope in the world tonight were it merely for this reason. That it is only the gospel that understands the cause of our troubles. And you see, you don't stand any hope of curing a condition unless you can first of all make a diagnosis. Diagnosis is essential before you can treat. And if you don't know the cause of the troubles and of the ills, what chance do you stand of curing it, or of ameliorating it, or of improving it? 
And here I say, we can claim that it is the gospel of our Lord that alone understands the human situation this evening and can give us an adequate explanation of why the world is as it is. Now let's look at it. Look at our world. Here we are with all our learning and all our sophistication, all our science and all that we are so proud of, and yet we've had two world wars already in this century, and they're piling up these horrible armaments. That's the international position. Look at the national position in this or in any other country. The awful problem of immorality and vice, separation and divorce, theft and robbery, juvenile delinquency, all the nations are in great trouble and in great perplexity. Never has the condition of men been more desperate than it is at this present time. But the question is, what's the cause of it? Why is it like this? We've never had better education. We've multiplied our schools. We've multiplied our colleges and universities. We've multiplied all our cultural agencies. We've improved traveling facilities. And yet, in spite of it all, the world is in this terrible predicament. Why is that? What's the matter? And it is here, I claim, that the gospel alone has an adequate answer and an accurate diagnosis. What is it? Well, the apostle gives it us. In the first three verses of this chapter, look here, he says to these Ephesian Christians, do you remember what you were once like? I will remind you, says the apostle, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That's what you were like, he says. Now, this is the truth always about the non-Christian. This is the truth about everybody in this congregation who isn't a Christian. It is the truth of every non-Christian in the entire universe at this moment. Dead in trespasses and sins. What's he mean? Well, he means that they were spiritually dead. And dead in and as the result of trespasses and sins. Now, the word death is a very strong word, isn't it? We have an adage which tells us that while there is life, there is hope. A man may be desperately ill. He may be so ill that some say, well, he's gone. You can't see him breathing. You can't feel his pulse. Ah, but if there's still a flicker of life, there is hope. But as to man in sin, there is none. You were he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. And when he says dead, he means dead. The unbeliever, the non-Christian, is spiritually dead. He has no contact with the life of God. This is life eternal, says our Lord, that they might know the, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Well, if that is life, death is the opposite. And the trouble with the non-Christian is that he is merely existing. He has no life. He is in no relationship to God that is living and vital. He doesn't receive the blessings of God. He is outside, shut off from the life of God without any spiritual life in him at all. No realization of his soul and its eternal possibilities. Spiritually dead. Entirely cut off from all the beneficent influences of God and his infinite grace. Dead in trespasses and sins. But he adds to that, you notice, wherein he says, in time past ye walked, according to the course of this world. In that state, he says, of spiritual death, you walked, you lived, you had your being, uh, according to the course of this world. Now, what he means by that, of course, is this. He says, in that state of spiritual death, your whole outlook upon life and your whole mode of living was entirely determined by what he calls the course of this world. What's he mean by that? Well, we call it today the thing to do. How is it that the non-Christian lives? Well, he likes to tell us, of course, that he's got free will and that he does everything that he wants to do and decides to do, that he determines everything by his own free will. No, no, says Paul, that wasn't it at all. You walked according to the course of this world. What determined your thinking and what determined your life, he says, was the mind and the outlook of this world. 
You did the thing to do. I needn't keep you with this. We're all familiar with it. What is it that determines how the vast majority of people live tonight? There's no difficulty about answering that question. Most people are doing what everybody else is doing. It's the age of advertising, the age of propaganda. Look at that woman. She uses that particular brand of soap. Why? She's seen on the television that everybody's using it. So she uses it. We are governed almost entirely by these means and media of advertising and of propaganda. So it is the simple truth to say that the non-Christian simply walks according to the course of this world. Round and round he goes with the merry-go-round of life, doing what everybody else is doing. If he sees a crowd, he joins it. He does what everybody else does. He's a slave to fashions. You see it in every department. You see it in dress. You see it in speech. You see it in interest. It's everywhere. The crowd is like a crowd of sh flock of sheep, simply following without knowing why it's doing so. It's the opposite of free will. It is slavery. The non-Christian is entirely a slave to the mind and the outlook of this present world. So, says the apostle, that's where you were. But you see, he hasn't finished. He now comes to the most important thing of all. Because somebody may ask, well, what is it that determines the mind of this world? If you say that the non-Christian is governed by the mind and the outlook of this world, what determines that? The apostle's got his answer. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh, in the children of disobedience. Here, my friends, is the most important thing of all. And here is the point, of course, at which the gospel has a complete monopoly of truth. There is no other agency in the world tonight that is telling the world and its peoples that the essential cause of its troubles is to be found not in man even, but in the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. What's he talking about? He is talking about the devil, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He calls him in 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this world. That's what he is this mighty unseen spiritual power that is controlling the whole universe. Man is his slave. Man in the fall became the slave of this tremendous power that governs and controls the mind, the outlook, the habits, the practice, the behavior of all humanity that is outside Christ. Here's the important matter. To the apostle, there was nothing more important than this. Indeed, he even tells the Christian that, in a sense, this is the thing he's always got to remember. In other words, in the sixth chapter of this great epistle, as he's winding up his whole statement, he says this. Listen, he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The problem is not simply to stand up against men or to stand up against your own flesh and blood. You're not simply up against man or humanity. What then? Oh but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high or in heavenly places. That's the explanation. This world is being dominated and controlled by these evil powers headed up by the prince of them all, Satan, the god of this world. Have you ever heard the statesman saying that? Have you ever heard the philosophers saying that? Have you ever heard your educationists saying that? Of course not. And that is why they fail. They haven't realized the ultimate cause of all our ills and troubles. But wait a minute. The apostle now goes on to tell us how this kind of life manifests itself and works itself out in the third verse, among whom he says also... We all had our conversation in times past. What kind of life was it? What kind of conversation? What kind of behavior was it? Well, he says it was a life lived in the lusts of our flesh. And immediately subdivides that into two groups, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. 
He says, you know, that's the sort of life you lived. You are entirely governed by the devil, and he made you live a life of lust. You were not living an intelligent life, he said. You were not living an intellectual life, though you may have regarded yourself as an intellectual. No, no, you were living a life of desire. The natural, unregenerate, non-Christian man is always governed by his impulses and his desires and his instincts. Lust, inordinate affection. These drives that the psychologists talk about, these are the things that govern men, whether they're able men or ignorant men. doesn't matter. They are creatures of passion and of lusts. And so, I say, he divides them up. He says these show themselves partly by the desires of the flesh. I needn't keep you. You know what this means. We see so much of it. These are the people who live only to satisfy what? Well, hunger and thirst and sex. The desires of the flesh. And the whole world is living after this tonight. That's why you get so much of it on your television. These women, these licensed prostitutes, what else can you call them? With their supposed romances. They don't know the meaning of romance nor of love. They are just creatures of lust. The desires of the flesh. They live to eat. They live to drink. They live to indulge their sex instinct. And these are the things that keep them going. These are the things that govern their life. Now, I'm not only talking about one class of society. You get it in every class of society. We've had it in public in England recently. In the higher circles of society, you've got it in this country. A life of lust. The desires of the flesh. But let nobody think here tonight that you are not guilty of living a life or have been guilty at one time of living a life according to the desires, the lust of the flesh. He says there's another section, the desires of the mind. Someone may say to me, I've never committed adultery, I've never got drunk. I'm not a creature of lust and passion. You have no right to convict me of that. I have, wait a minute. This lust can show itself in the desires, inordinate desires of the mind. What are they? Well, they're things like this. Ambition. There's no greater lust in the world tonight than ambition. Have you seen that ambitious man? He's so ambitious that he can't sleep at night. He's planning, he's scheming. There's a rival, and he wants to get him down, or he wants to get ahead of him. That's a lust. And it keeps him awake at night. That's nothing but sheer lust. Jealousy, envy. Merely spite, hatred. Have you ever seen a man in a temper? Have you seen a man white with rage and trembling? That's a lust. He can't control himself. He's lost control. He's been governed and controlled by this passion that is greater and stronger than himself. That's nothing but a lust of the mind. And there they are. And that is the whole of humanity. Living according to the desires of the flesh, the body, and of the mind. That's what you wear, says Paul, and the result of it all is this. And we're all, by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. And by that he means this, that God looks down from heaven upon such humanity, and his wrath is upon it. God, my dear friend, is a hater of sin. He abominates it. He hates it with the whole intensity of his divine being. And the wrath of God is upon such living. I believe that that's the explanation of the state of the world tonight. And that is why I'm making this argument. I am asserting that the gospel alone holds out any hope because it is the gospel alone that understands the cause of our ills. And this is the cause of our ills. Why have we had these two world wars? Why all our present troubles, in spite of all our advances and education, and all our good desires and our noble aspirations? There's only one answer. It is the wrath of God being manifested. Mankind in its cleverness has been saying for a hundred years that it can get on without God. Science was going to be sufficient, and man, with his learning, turned his back upon God and walked away. Very well, says God. If you say and claim that you can live life without me, get on with it. And I believe that we've had what we've had in this century because God has withdrawn his restraining grace. 
As Paul puts it in Romans 1, the second half, he has handed us over to a reprobate mind. That's how he shows his wrath. He's abandoning us. New York is tonight a sign of the abandonment of God, of a sinful humanity. He's withdrawn the restraints, and you get all your perversions and all your horrors because it is a part of the manifestation of the wrath of God upon all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That's who you were, says the apostle. That's the kind of life you lived. A deadness, a spiritual deadness, a life of lust, and the wrath of God was upon you. Is there no hope there? Oh, yes, there is, he says, in spite of it all. But God, and immediately you see hope. You see, your statesmen don't talk about these things, do they? Why? Well, they don't believe them. They don't know. They are medicating symptoms. They are looking at manifestations of the problem, and that's why they never succeed. All their conferences come to nothing, and I'm afraid they always will, because the Bible tells us that they're never going to be able to make a better world. The biggest fool in the world tonight is a man who is hopeful as he looks at the statesmen. I'm not here to criticize them, but I am here to say that they never understand the real essence of the problem. It is this book and this book alone that gives us a real insight into and an understanding of the nature of man's problem. There it is, and there's only one hope for it, and it's of God, but God. And as I look at the hopelessness of it all, and as I go down these terrible steps in the first three verses of this chapter and feel my final hopelessness, I hear this blessed word, but... And the gospel comes in. Now, that is the way I say the gospel always comes in. It comes in as a flash of light into the darkness. It's like a man walking along a dark country road in the pitch darkness of a winter's night. And suddenly a car comes with its headlight and there's a flash of light. That's how the gospel came. Matthew quotes an Old Testament statement which puts it perfectly. The people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. My friends, the butt is the butt of hope. And it is the only hope in the world tonight. Show me any hope in any other direction. Can you see it in any conference of any description, in any human organization, in any human ability? You cannot. There is nothing but gross darkness. This, and this alone, holds out any hope this evening. Very well, there it is. It is the but of hope. But let me hurry on. This little word, but, also in, does another thing for us. It introduces us into the realm of the miraculous and the supernatural and the divine. It says, but God. And immediately... We are lifted up from the human level, the human scene, to this level of the divine and the miraculous and the supernatural. And I thank God for this. The gospel of Jesus Christ is frankly miraculous, supernatural, and divine. The type of Christian that I simply don't begin to understand at all is that type of Christian that always is so nervous about the miraculous and the supernatural. There are many such today. They say, you know, these modern people, these scientists, they don't believe in miracles, and they, therefore they try to soft-pedal the miraculous because we want to make our gospel presentable. We've got to put it in such a way that they'll be ready to receive it, and they won't take miracles. No, no, they're scientific in their outlook. So we soft-pedal the miraculous. We stumble at it. We're a little bit afraid of it. My dear friend, if this gospel were not miraculous, it wouldn't be a gospel. When you realize the true state and condition of men, you won't have any difficulty in accepting miracles. Man is in such a position that nothing but a miracle can possibly save him. And thank God the announcement of the gospel is that the miracle has happened. But God, the supernatural, the miraculous, the divine has entered. No, I want to be quite fair. Why is it that people are so nervous about this miraculous and supernatural? Well, I suggest 
The answer is that in our folly, we will persist in looking at everything from the human end and from the earthly standpoint. Let me give you an example or two of people who've done this very thing. The first example I give you is that of Mary, who had the great privilege of bearing our blessed Lord and Savior as the babe in Bethlehem. Listen to the story. It's in Luke 1. We are told that the archangel Gabriel was sent to her and he addressed her in this manner. Verse 28. The angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, Hallelujah, praise God. Not a bit of it. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be? Seeing I know not a man. What are you talking about, said Mary to the archangel? You are waxing eloquent and saying that I'm going to bear a child, a son is going to be wonderful and inherit the kingdom of David and reign without end. What are you talking about? Don't you realize that I'm but a virgin? I've never known a man. I'm not a married woman. How can I bear a son? What are you talking about? Mary stumbled at this glorious announcement. She couldn't take it. She couldn't accept it. And she objects to the statement and stands back in amazement and almost in anger. But listen. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born in thee shall be called the Son of God. For with God, Nothing shall be impossible. Wait a moment, says the archangel to Mary. You say this can't be, this is impossible. Mary, you don't understand. You don't realize who I am. I'm not a human being. I'm not a human emissary. And I don't come from any human court. Look at me again, he said. I am an angel. I am an archangel. And I'm the bearer of no message from men. I am the agent and the emissary of the living God, the all highest. I'm not talking about what's going to happen to you on a human level. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. The all highest shall cover thee. This isn't human. This is miraculous. This is divine. This is supernatural. I'm not talking about man's action. I'm talking about the action of God. Don't say anything's impossible with God. That's the gospel. What was the matter with Mary? Ah, you see, Mary looked at the thing from the human standpoint. Typical representative of the modern outlook and mentality. If we don't understand the thing, we can't believe it. We feel it's wrong. I can't believe anything I can't understand, says a modern man. Neither could Mary 2,000 years ago, very nearly. But you see, she's rebuked with God. Nothing shall be impossible. And if that were not true, I would have no gospel to preach tonight. There would be no gospel. She stumbled at the miraculous, the supernatural, and the divine. But fair play to Mary. She's not the only one who stumbled in that way. We've got a great man depicted in John 3 who did exactly the same thing. A man whose name was Nicodemus. Do you remember the story? Here comes this great man, this teacher in Israel to our Lord one night, and he said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And he was on the verge, obviously, of asking a question. What he was saying in his introduction was this. You know, he said, I've been watching you the last two or three days. I've listened to your teaching. I've watched your miracles. And I'm convinced that God is with you. 
No man could do what you've been doing except God be with him. I'm a master of Israel, but you've got much more than I have. I want to have that extra. How can I get it? Our Lord cut across him and interrupted him, saying, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then there happens this most interesting scene. I always like to think of the following scene in terms of a debating society. There are two protagonists, our Lord and this great teacher Nicodemus. And our Lord has just made this announcement, this statement. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then I see Nicodemus getting up with a sarcastic smile upon his face. And this is what he says. How can a man be born when he's old? And then with still more sarcasm. Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Loud laughter and applause from the audience. Nicodemus has simply scored a bull point. There is no answer. He's ridiculed the case. Here is one saying, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Ah, says Nicodemus, I don't want to be unfair. But evidently he says, I shouldn't have come to you at a late hour like this. You're tired. You've been preaching so much. You're weary. You've worked so many miracles. Virtue has gone out of you. You're obviously overtired. You're no longer able to think clearly. You say, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look here, are you really suggesting uh, that uh, a man can enter the second time into his mother's womb? be born? Is, is that your point? Is that what you're saying? And you see the sarcasm. How can a man be born when he's old? Look at me, he says, I'm an old man. Are you really saying that at my age I can go back again into my mother's womb and be born once more? And I say, oh, it was regarded as wonderful by the crowd listening. But listen, our Lord gets up quietly and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, nor whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. What does all that mean? It means this. Wait a minute, Nicodemus, said our Lord. You are not quite as clever as you think you are. You say to me, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? I'll answer you, Nicodemus. Certainly not. A man cannot enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born. A man cannot undergo a physical birth the second time. It's impossible. But who said he could? I didn't. Listen, Nicodemus. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And at that level, you're absolutely right. But I wasn't talking about the flesh. I was talking about the spiritual. I'm talking about being born of water and of the spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's what I'm talking about. Don't marvel, don't wonder. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. You're trying to understand this thing, men. You're trying to understand miracles. You're pitting your little pygmy mind against the infinite and the absolute and the eternal. Fool! Marvel not! Listen to me, he said. What I'm talking about is more like the wind. You don't see the wind. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going. All you do is to see its effects and results. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. My dear men, he said, 
You are in trouble because you are looking at these things along the natural level. You are regarding them from the human standpoint. And you are in trouble. You are in confusion. Of course you are. I am talking about spirit, not flesh. Give up trying to understand. Humble yourself. Bow to the glorious breezes of the, that come from heaven. Listen to the spirit. You have got to be a little child again. You need to be born again. You see, the trouble with Nicodemus was identical with that with Mary. He was regarding the statement in the human, earthly, philosophical, intellectual manner. And it appears to be ridiculous nonsense. Ah, but that's where the mistake comes in. This isn't ordinary. This isn't human. This isn't moral uplift. This is God. This is miracle. This is divine action. And this little word, but, lifts us up to the level of the divine and the supernatural and the miraculous. Thank God for it. It's the only hope tonight that God can do what is impossible with men. But I must hasten on. It's an extraordinary word, this. What is the next thing this little word, but, suggests to us? Well, it is invariably, isn't it, the but of surprise. Have you ever read this second chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians without being pulled up when you come to these two words? As I say, in the first three verses, he takes you down and down and down and down until you're under the wrath of God in utter hopelessness. Then, but, surprise, amazement, of course. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the most surprising thing in the world tonight. And I take leave to tell you this, my friend, in the name of God. If what you regard as gospel tonight is not the most surprising, amazing, astounding thing to you, you haven't got it at all. You've got something else, a false gospel. You've got a religion or something. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the most amazing, astonishing, surprising thing that has ever entered into this world. And, of course, it's not a bit surprising that this apostle of all apostles should have felt that and should always have put it like that because if ever there was a man in this world who had a surprise it was Saul of Tarsus you remember his story don't you Saul of Tarsus a Pharisee of the Pharisees a Hebrew of the Hebrews he'd heard about this Jesus of Nazareth and he hated it he hated him he hated all his teaching he regarded him as a blasphemer. Who was this carpenter who had never been trained in the schools of the Pharisees, who was setting himself up as a teacher? He must be got rid of. He hated him as all the Pharisees did. And he thought he was doing God's service by trying to exterminate Christianity. And you remember how one day he got authority from the chiefs in Jerusalem to go down to Damascus to exterminate the little church at Damascus. And he tells us himself that he set off on his journey breathing out threatenings and slaughter. The mere anticipation of massacring and destroying those little Christians filled him with a devilish glee. He was breathing out threatening slaughter. The thought of getting rid of these miserable wretches. And if there was one thing that Saul of Tarsus was absolutely certain of, that morning as he went down the road to Damascus, it was this, that he, Saul of Tarsus, would never be a Christian. <laughs> that was an absolute certainty, this blasphemy, this nonsense. He hated it. The last thing that could happen was that he would ever be a Christian. But you remember what happened to him? Somewhere around about noonday on that road, he saw light shining in the heavens above the brightest shining of the sun and a face. And oh, the majesty and the glory and the beauty and the tenderness and the compassion of that face. He'd never seen such a face. And a voice came and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And there he is helpless on his back face to face with this transcendent glory, and all he can say is this, Who art thou, Lord? Because it's obvious that he was some Lord. This was no human being. This was some divine personage that he was looking at. Who art thou, Lord? And the answer that came back to him was the very last answer he ever expected to hear. 
in his agony and amazement, he says, Who art thou, Lord? And the answer came back, I am Jesus, whom thou art persecuting. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. What? That blessed person, Jesus, the despised Nazarene, the carpenter? Yes, perfectly true. He saw it in a moment. The Jesus he'd reviled and hated and blasphemed is none other than the eternal Son of God. He's the Lord of glory, but still more marvelous and wonderful. That same Jesus, the Son of God, the Lord of glory, had loved him, Saul of Tarsus. He loved him at that moment. He'd always loved him. Even as he was persecuting and blaspheming and hating him, he still loved him. He'd loved him so much that he'd given himself for him and his sins on the cross on Calvary. So in writing to the Galatians, he says, The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the Christian. You know, the Apostle Paul never got over that. He never got over this fact that he'd been so tragically wrong about the person of Jesus and about the work of Jesus. He never recovered. He was always astounded and amazed at himself as a Christian and as an apostle. I can prove what I'm saying. I'm not drawing on my imagination. Look at him again writing to the Galatians. This is how he puts it. I live. And then he immediately adds, yet not I. Here's the man in trouble. He says, I live, yet not I. I am alive, I am not alive. He's contradicting himself. He doesn't understand himself. What he's saying is this, you see. He says, I live, I am Saul of Tarsus. What are you talking about? He says, you can't be Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus hated Christ. He blasphemed him, he persecuted him and his people. You cannot be Saul of Tarsus. But he says, I am Saul of Tarsus. I am the man that once was a little boy brought up in Tarsus, taught the scriptures at his mother's knee. I am Saul of Tarsus. It is impossible. You cannot be Saul of Tarsus. I live yet not I. That's the Christian. The Christian is a man who cannot understand himself. He has become a problem and an enigma to himself. And you see, Paul has only got one way of explaining himself to himself. I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, is it possible that I, Saul of Tarsus, should be a lover of Christ and a preacher of his gospel? Is it possible? Yes, it is. For he has come in. It isn't I. I am myself. I'm not myself. I'm the same man. Oh, but there's a new man. There's a difference. Christ living in me. He only understands himself in terms of the indwelling Christ. And that is true of every Christian. You're not a Christian unless you're amazed at yourself. If you can understand yourself tonight, you're not a Christian. If you can explain all you've done and all that's happened to you, you're not a Christian. If you're here tonight because of things you've done, I take leave to tell you, you're not a Christian. There is only one explanation of the Christian. He is what he is by the grace of God. I live yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. Do you know this blessed surprise? Are you, my dear friend, amazed at the fact that he died for you? You know, I'm sometimes afraid that we are much too familiar with our scriptures and some of these hymns. We've so sentimentalized them, we've lost their glory. Can you sing of the cross and remain unmoved? Shame on you if you can. You've never understood the depths of that love. You've never seen the depth of your own sin. You've never measured the glory of the cross. Listen to Charles Wesley putting it, who had always lived a good, moral, godly life. This is how he puts it. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain, for me who him to death pursued? Amazing love, and can it be that thou, my God, hast died for me? Do you know anything of that? Are you filled with amazement and astonishment? If not, I say, dwell in contemplation on that cross. 
until you know something of the amazement and say with eyes that watch, love so amazing, so divine. Demands my soul, my life, my all. I'm emphasizing the surprise, the but of surprise. Though I was there, God came in. And I am what I am by the grace of God. And I can't really believe it. It's too good to be true that God should have done this to me. That's the Christian. My time is going. But you know I've got a great texture. But God. What else? Let me give you some notes to think of and to work out for yourselves. The remainder of this summer, the remainder of this autumn, the remainder of next winter, and the whole of your life, and you'll go on doing it in eternity. Here are some of them. This little word, but, tells us here and is very careful to emphasize that our salvation is altogether and entirely of God. That's where you were, says Paul, and you'd still be there. Were it not for God? But God? It's God who's done it. And you see, the apostle won't let you escape this, my friends, however much you may want to do, so listen to him. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, then he slips it in in brackets. By grace he are saved, lest you say that you've saved yourself or that some evangelist has saved you, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places, etc. Then back he comes to it in verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. Watch the negative as well as the positive, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. It is all of God from the very beginning to the very end. The Bible is the record of the activity of God. God created. Man sinned. God came down. God, in the fullness of the time, sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, God so loved the world, salvation entirely altogether from Alpha to Omega is of God. It is all of grace and his alone must be the glory. That's what the little word but tells us. Are we all quite clear about it? There is nothing that I so detest as to hear people saying sometimes. You know, says the man, I am so and so's convert. What nonsense. No man can save a soul. A man can get decisions. A man can get people to join his church, but that isn't making a man a Christian of necessity. Before a man is a Christian, he's got to be born again. He needs the life of God in his soul, and God alone can do that. I'm reminded of the story of the great Charles Haddon Spurgeon, that great Baptist preacher in London, in the last century. Mr. Spurgeon, in addition to preaching on Sundays, used to have a service every Thursday night. And one Thursday night he was walking to his service along the pavement when a drunken man lurched into him. And as he did so, he accosted him and said, Mr. Spurgeon, I'm one of your converts, you know. And Mr. Spurgeon looked at him and gave that immortal reply. He said, I can well believe it. For you are obviously not one of God's converts. All right, my friends, you laugh if you like, but there's a profound truth there. Not one of God's converts. No, no, this is the work of the Almighty God. He must have all the glory, and there must be none in man at all. It is God's work from beginning to end. But let me add another thought to you. Why has God ever done this? Why didn't God blast the world to eternal destruction when Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden? Why has he tolerated us so long? Why hasn't he brought history to an end? Why does he tolerate what's happening in the world tonight? Why, above all, did he ever send his son into a world like this and even to the death of the cross? Do you know the answer? 
It's because God is eternally different from us. And that's what the world, word but tells us. You see, that's the meaning of this little word. God does this because he's absolutely different. It's the but of contrast. God, eternally different. He shows us how he is different. But God, he says, who is rich in mercy. There's not much mercy about us, is there? If our fate and eternal destiny depended upon us, our outlook would be very poor. Let him have it, we say. He deserves it richly. I did no harm. He did it all. That woman, that man. Mercy, God, is rich in mercy. He's so different from us. This but is the measure of the difference between God and men. It's a word that's as big as that. But let's go on. In his, for his great love, wherewith he loved us. What do we know about love? As I say, we know something about lust and affection and fascination. Oh, how little we know about love. But God is love. This word but is the measure of the distance, the eternal distance between God and men. For his great love wherewith he loved us and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his Grace, what's this? Well, grace means favor shown to the utterly undeserving. It is kindness shown to those who deserve nothing but reprobation and hell. Grace, his grace, his exceeding riches of his grace. In the next chapter he talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ. Grace that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. There it is. This is God. And he does it because he's eternally different. And if you would know something about the love and the grace and the kindness of God, this is where you see it on Calvary's hill. There is the measure of it all. What is it? Well, it is God giving up his only begotten, dearly beloved son to death and cruelty and shame and suffering and agony and death. Why? That you might be forgiven. That's the measure of the love of God. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For adventure for a good man, some men might dare to die. It's a very rare, it's a very exceptional thing. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God gave him to die for us. And there's the love of God shown to hell-deserving vile rebels and sinners. That's the measure of this word, but. That's the basis of the whole of our salvation. Let me give you another thought to work out. This little word, but, is a measure of the power of God, which shows us the difference that it makes to us. Do you know what it does? Do you know what happens to a man when God comes and exercises this mighty power, this almighty miraculous power? Here it is. You are the quickened who are dead. You were in a grave of sin. You were dead. You were lifeless. You couldn't do anything. How can a man who's dead decide to accept Christ? What utter nonsense. No, no. He's dead. He's incapable. Totally incapable. He's totally unable. He can do nothing. God puts life into him. Gives ability to him. Moves him. Puts a spark of life into him. You, as he quickened, were dead. But he not only puts life into us in that grave, he has raised us up together with Christ. And here we are, no longer in a grave of sin. We are walking about the ground and able to move about freely, raised us together with Christ. But he hasn't stopped at that. Listen to this. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh, my dear friends, Christians, tonight, do you know the truth about yourself? Do you know where you are at this moment? 
You say I'm seated in Hawthorne Gospel Church in Hawthorne, New Jersey. Perfectly right, but I'll tell you something more. At this moment, you are seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He doesn't say he's going to do this. He says he's done it. He hath quickened us. He hath raised us. He hath caused us to be seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is assurance. Augustus, top lady, expresses it. More happy, but not more secure, the glorified spirits in heaven. A Christian is not only a man who believes in Christ, he is in Christ. He's incorporated in Christ. He's been crucified with him. He died with him. He's risen with him. He's seated with him in the heavenly places. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.